Good evening. Uh, if you'll find a seat, we'll go ahead and begin. My name is Rick Mars. I'm the Dean of Seaver College, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, W. David Baird Distinguished Lecture Series of this fall academic calendar. Uh, we have two this semester, and we'll have two in the spring. So our first tonight, uh, we're delighted you're here to uh, engage science and religion. Uh, let me let you know, the second one is coming up October 30th, so if you'd put it on your calendar, it's a professor from USC, and she's a renowned historian. She uh, works in the area of um, everything from magic and science in Europe, uh, the history of that, but she's also now become a novelist, and so uh, she's going to, and her novel is a fiction novel about witches. And so she's going to talk some about that. You know, what do vampires wear when they go to work? So if you're interested in that, you will want to come. She'll be quite engaging. Again, let me let you know the format this evening. Our speaker will speak for about 45 or 50 minutes. And then we'll have uh, ample time for question and answer after that. I'll try to field uh, questions and um, uh, we'll have plenty of time for you to engage. And so we're delighted with that. Also, after... Um, question and answer, we will, uh, this, our speaker will be up here and we'll bring books up here and if you'd like to buy a copy of uh, his books, he'll be glad to autograph those for you and so we've got those available tonight. We're delighted that uh, we can do that. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker tonight. Professor Ed Larson is University Professor of History at Seaver College and then Law at the Law School. And uh, he's a good friend of our speaker this evening, and so I asked Ed if he would come and introduce our speaker. Ed. Well, it's actually my pleasure to be here um, to do this. Uh, Peter Harrison holds advanced degrees from the University of Queensland in his home country of Australia, and also advanced degrees from Yale and Oxford. He began his academic career at teaching at Bond University in Australia, uh, where he was a professor of, the history, of history and philosophy. In 2006, he was, he was named to a professorship in science and religion at the University of Oxford and was there for the next uh, five years, not only teaching but also serving as a director of the Ian Ramsey Center the leading center in issues of science and religion. Um, Peter is best known, I believe, in academic circles for a number of influential writings on Christianity and the origins of modern science. He has argued that changing approaches to the interpretation of the Bible had a significant impact on the development of modern science. Indeed, he has suggested that the biblical story of the fall played a key role in the development of experimental science. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities, a recipient of a Centennial Medal in 2003. But what brings us closest to home is that last year, in 2011, he was the Gifford Lecturer in Scotland. Now, if you don't know, the Gifford Lecture is probably the oldest and most distinguished lectureships in, in its field. For over 120 years, uh, lectures have been given on a regular basis, funded by the will of Adam Lord Gifford, um, to promote, and I'm reading from his will here, to promote and diffuse the study of natural theology in the widest sense of the term. That is in a broad sense, the relationship of science and religion. Now, this lecture series has some, of the, has some of the most distinguished lecturers in the last hundred years thinking about issues of religion and um, science. Some of the lecturers in this series have included Karl Barth, uh, Paul Tillich, William James, Arthur Eddington, Alfred North Whitehead, John Dewey, Albert Schweitzer, Reinhold Niebuhr, Niels Bohr, Arnold Toynbee, Charles Taylor, twice I believe, uh, J.B.S. Haldane, Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, Warren Heis uh, Werner Heisenberg, Alvin, Alvin Plantiga, and last year, and here tonight to reprieve and deal with issues 
that he discussed in the 2011 Gifford Lecture, Peter Harrison. Uh, well, thanks, uh, Ed, for that, uh, that introduction. And uh, thanks also to Dean Mars for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and uh, to, to see all of you here this evening. Uh, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about the religious origins of modern science, question mark. And just to give you a few clues as to where I'm going with this, I think there are some very simple models about the relationship between science and religion that are, are pretty commonplace. And, and one of the standard models is a model of conflict, that science and religion are, by their essential natures, uh, in conflict, and that their history has been one of uh, perennial warfare. Others have argued that re religion and science are really separate spheres of activity, and they don't have that much to do with each other. Um, and what I want to do in this lecture is to say that really both of these views are wrong, that there are interesting and complicated relations between science and religion, but that at the key period when science was developing in the West, historians refer to this period as the scientific revolution that took place in the 17th century, uh, I will argue that religion played a key and important role in establishing uh, science and also in consolidating scientific activity. That is to say, in making science a key part of uh, what Western uh, culture has been about from that time. So, religious origins of modern science, I'm going to talk about five different ways in which religion played a role in the emergence and persistence of science in the 17th century. And I'm going to speak first of all about motivations, then I'm going to talk about how religion played a role in providing criteria for choosing between alternative uh, scientific theories. I'm going to talk about the importance of religion in providing social sanctions for science. I'll explain in more detail what I mean by that. Uh, I'm going to talk about the way in which religion provided the necessary presuppositions upon which modern science was founded. And then finally, I'll say something about the way in which religion informed the methods of investigation, particularly experimental methods of investigation uh, in the 17th century. Now, of these five issues, I'll say something just very briefly about the first two, and I'll be a little more expansive about the last three. And the last three really are areas that my own research uh, has been engaged in. So these are areas of, of, of the, that are... Uh, of particular interest to me. Okay, so we'll start then with this, this basic question of motivations. Now, historically, it's very often difficult to tell what motivates particular individuals to do the activities that they do. However, sometimes individuals are quite explicit about what their motivations are, and we know for some key figures in the scientific revolution of the 17th century that they were motivated by religious concerns to do the scientific activities that they were involved in. And I'm just going to give you two examples. Uh, Johannes Kepler uh, was an astronomer, as you can see from his dates there, a key figure in establishing uh, the elliptical nature of planetary orbits, and he came up with three laws of planetary motion that I'll come back to later in the lecture, and these three laws of planetary motion were subsequently uh, brought into Newton's single law of universal gravity. So he was a, a pivotal figure in the scientific revolution. And this is what he says about his own vocation and his own motivations, that he had wanted, first of all, to be a theologian. That was his real goal. But he realized that astronomy was equally a theological preoccupation. Uh, and Kepler went on to talk about scientists as being priests of nature. So scientific activity for Kepler was something that he engaged in out of uh, religious motivations. Just a second figure uh, as an example of this mode of interaction is Robert Boyle, often known as the father of chemistry. And for those of you who remember your high school uh, physics 
on chemistry, perhaps you'll know Boyle's gas law that talks about the relationship between uh, pressure and volume of gases, and you can also add in uh, temperature there. So P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Uh, Boyle's law. I'll come back to laws of nature too later. Um, but this is what Boyle has to say about his personal motivation. So he says that discovering the perfections of God displayed in the creatures uh, is a more acceptable act of religion than the burning of sacrifices on altars and so on. And he also goes on to say that the rational contemplation of nature is philosophical worship of God. And interestingly, Boyle used exactly the same phrase that uh, Kepler used. Scientists, he said, were really priests of nature. Now, uh, these will be the only two examples I give. As I say, it's difficult to distinguish the motivations of individuals. But clearly, these two were motivated by religious concerns. If we can generalize more than this, we can say that virtually without exception, the key figures in the scientific revolution were people with pretty uh, orthodox religious commitments. It doesn't necessarily follow from that that their religious commitments motivated them to do science. But the general picture we see is one that for these individuals, their religious beliefs were at the very least compatible with their scientific activities. And in some specific cases, these two, for example, their scientific activities uh, were motivated by specific religious concerns. Okay, now I said I wouldn't say much about motivations, so I'm going to move on to this one, which is slightly more complicated, criteria for choosing between competing theories. Now, in the history of science, it often occurs, particularly at moments of historical change, that we have theories that compete with each other to explain the same phenomena. And very often these theories are empirically equivalent. And what I mean by that is that they give the same kind of predictability and they are equally consistent with the observational evidence. And that was the case in the, at the, the beginning of the 17th century with regard to the dominant astronomical models that were on offer and that are nicely depicted uh, in this frontispiece from uh, a book that comes from the middle of the 17th century. And what we see there is the muse of astronomy, Urania, who is holding a balance, and she is weighing up two astronomical models, and she is finding that one of these astronomical models uh, is the one to run with. Uh, and there's a third astronomical model at the bottom of the picture which has been discarded. And the identification of these models uh, at the top, the one that's, uh, that's not favoured, incidentally, in this uh, particular volume, the Copernican model, where the Earth and the planets, as you know, revolve around the sun. The intermediate model that, that Tycho Brahe had proposed, where the planets, apart from the Earth, all go around the sun, but the sun itself orbits the Earth, so the Earth is still stationary at the centre of the cosmos. And then the model that's been discarded at the bottom, the Ptolemaic model proposed by the philosopher, the uh, astronomer Ptolemy, uh, which was an Earth-centred uh, model. Now, what's interesting about these models, as I've said, is that they were empirically equivalent, that they all gave pretty good predictability in terms of the positions of the stars. Uh, each of them had some problems, um, but the question is, if it's the case that the evidence is the same for each of them, how then do we choose between them? Clearly, we can't use the evidence to distinguish, and so we use extra or, or propositions outside the realm of science to choose, and sometimes religious factors play a role in that. Aesthetic factors might also play a role. So, for example, the Copernican model was the simplest model and the most elegant mathematically. And this was one reason uh, why it was preferred. But clearly, Catholic authorities at this time preferred the Earth-centred model, and that was either the Ptolemaic one at the bottom of the picture or the Tychonic one, which here is the one uh, that is favoured. 
Uh, but the point I want to make here is that one way in which religious considerations play a role in the emergence of science is that they, choose, they allow people to uh, have a preference for one model over the other when nothing else uh, weighs in the balance. And this also gives me the opportunity to say something very briefly about the Galileo situation. The Galileo affair is typically regarded as emblematic of uh, the history of science and religion relations, and that is to say emblematic of uh, conflict between science and religion. The point I would make is that this is not emblematic of a science and religion clash, but rather of a, of a clash between two scientific theories, uh, and that the evidence was by no means uh, unambiguously in favour of uh, the uh, sun-centred Copernican model and uh, if you're interested to know what some of the evidence against Galileo's view was, there was an absence of stellar parallax. Well, that means if the Earth is in motion, uh, we should see changes in the relative positions of the fixed stars. Now, you can try this at home, um, but at risk of making a fool of myself, you want to know how parallax works. If you, if you close one eye and put two fingers up and you move your head, the, 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 when you're, the fingers are lined up, when you move your head, they, they seem to move apart. And that's really a kind of demonstration of, of parallax. Yes, you can try it in right now if you want to. <laughs> but what would we, we would expect if the Earth was in motion was that, that the positions of the stars relative to each other would change, and there was no evidence of stellar parallax at this time. In fact, there was only evidence of stellar parallax. It was only discovered uh, in the early 19th century. So this should have counted against the idea that the Earth was in motion, okay? Uh, but clearly, um, it didn't in this case. My general point here is that the, the issue of whether Galileo was right or wrong was by no means clear, and it wasn't purely religious considerations that determined the condemnation of Galileo, but rather uh, scientific considerations as well. Uh, and there's much more that could be said about this, but, um, but I'll move on. To go back to my general point about how religious considerations play a role in the emergence of uh, science, religion might lead people either to choose or to reject some scientific model. In this case, in the case of Catholicism, religion seems to have had a negative uh, impact on the emergence of science, but it's interesting that some Protestant thinkers actually preferred the Copernican model, again, on religious grounds. Now, as I've said, I'm not going to talk too much about those first two things, motivation and criteria for choosing between competing theories, because I want to focus really on these last three considerations, which I think are the most important. And the first point here is to do with, well, the third point, is to do with uh, social and cultural sanctions. Uh, and I should say, let me just make some general comments before I explain exactly what's going on here. If we want to argue that Christianity played a role in the emergence of science, how might we as historians go about doing that? We don't have laboratories where we can run experiments, but what we do have is comparative histories where we can compare the course of scientific development in other cultures. And so we have a couple of other models, and one model would be Islamic science. In the Middle Ages, there was a flourishing Islamic science. There was a very sophisticated astronomy. It was, in certain respects, in, in all respects, in fact, ahead of what was going on in the West. And yet something happened to Islamic science, OK? Science did not take off in Islamic culture. It took off in the modern West. And so we ask ourselves the question, what's distinctive about the West? such that science happens there and happens then in the 17th century. What are the variables that are different between that and Islamic culture that means science flourishes uh, in the West? The other contrast case is, of course, China, which again has a, a fantastic technology and is well ahead of the West in the Middle Ages. But again, we can ask the question, why is it that science doesn't seem to take off in China, 
but it does take off in the West. And what we need to look for here then are perhaps cultural values that underpin science in the West, cultural values that might be absent in those contrast cases of uh, Islam and, and China. The other thing that's important to understand is that what we're trying to explain here is not merely the appearance of technology or the appearance of brilliant scientific minds coming up with theories. It's more than that. It's the persistence of science. It's the emergence of a scientific culture where we see science moving from being just one thing amongst a range of cultural priorities to being one of the most important, and in fact I think in Western society some people would argue the most, single most important cultural activity. So it's not merely having brilliant scientists, it's getting behind the scientific enterprise, consolidating it, and we might say giving it legs. And historians and sociologists have argued that what does that in the West are particular values, and those values, it might be argued, are religious ones. And I'm just going to suggest how that might be the case. One guy who gave us and was some important clues in this quest for the values that underpin science was the sociologist Robert Merton. His dates are there. As I say, he was a, a, primarily a sociologist who was interested in history. Uh, he gave us some uh, very familiar phrases like role model, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy are two of his phrases. Uh, and, but in a book called Science, Technology and Society in 17th Century England, uh, Merton uh, analysed the composition of the early Royal Society. Now, the Royal Society kicked off in 1660. It's a now the most prestigious uh, body of scientists, I think it's fair to say, uh, in the world. And what Merton found interesting about the composition of the early Royal Society was that it had a disproportionate number of Puritans. And so we can see there, it's 62% of the early membership of the Royal Society were Puritans. The rest were mostly Anglicans. And this was at a time when Puritans were, uh, w did not have that percentage of representation in the general population. Now, subsequently, Merton did this work uh, in the first half of the last century. Subsequently, people have found all sorts of problems with the methodology that he used, and I'm not attempting to uh, argue for the Merton thesis that Puritan values underpinned science, but I would say he was asking the right question, and the question he asked was, what is it about Puritan values that leads them to value science? And that then leads to the more general question of, what are the religious values that underpin and give uh, uh, a permanence and value to scientific activity? And my suggestion is that some of these values are religiously motivated. Um, some of you will realise that, that, uh, that Merton sounds like a scientific version of the sociologist Max Weber, who famously argued that the Puritan ethic uh, gave rise to, to capitalism. Okay, so once again, the general argument is about how religious values underpin some of the most significant features of uh, Western culture. I'll just give you one little, since we've got the graph up there, I'll just give you one more graph uh, that I think gives some substance to the general claims of Merton. I think he was mistaken in thinking that Puritanism specifically had this set of values, but there was something about the Protestant culture of 17th century England uh, that led them to value scientific activity and, as you can see from this graph, put them well ahead of the pack. And so if we go back to this comparative issue that I raise with you where we compare what's happening in 17th century Europe with other contenders, medieval Islam and medieval China, what we can see in those other two cases is what we, what we might call a boom-bust pattern of scientific activity, where we have an efflorescence of science, but then it just dies down, and then bubbles up and dies down. The pattern we see in the West 
is an efflorescence that continues and continues and continues, and so that science gradually becomes the dominant force that uh, it is today. And, and my argument, and part of what I'm going to be developing over the rest of the lecture, is this point, is that certain values unique to Western Christendom are what get behind science and drive it and consolidate it. And just to show you that I'm not the only one who's arguing this, uh, the, uh, the British-born but now Australian-based historian Stephen Gorkroger, who is uh, currently writing a multi-volume history of science in the West. This is the first volume, The Emergence of a Scientific Culture, where he looks at science and the shaping of modernity from uh, the high Middle Ages to the middle of the 17th century, argues precisely this, that a good part of the distinctive uh, success at the level of legitimation and consolidation, come back to those two, uh, two claims in it, legitimation and consolidation, is not from a separation of religion and natural philosophy, natural philosophy is the word for science that was then used, but rather from the fact that natural philosophy could be accommodated to projects in natural theology. Let me just go back to the th second and third line, legitimation and consolidation. I think consolidation we understand, and that goes to the question of boom-bust. We don't get a boom-bust pattern of science, but we get science being consolidated as a crucial part of the culture. And legitimation is not a question we now ask about science because we think about science as a, a kind of activity that legitimates itself. We firmly believe that science gives us a true picture of the universe. We believe in the technological benefits that science generates. And we don't ask the question about whether science is a legitimate enterprise or not. But in the 17th century, the picture was rather different. Science was not something that was self-evidently a good thing. It had not generated great benefits. It was not clear that it generated a true picture of the universe. And science requires then values from outside the scientific enterprise that will give it legitimacy. And the argument that I would put and the argument that, that this historian puts is that it's religion that provides for the legitimacy of the sci scientific activity. Uh, and when I come to discuss uh, methods of investigation, which is the last part of the lecture, I will argue for the specific religious values that will give science this, this ongoing social legitimacy uh, and that lead to its consolidation uh, in Western society. Just to, to, by the by, just so you get some indication of the status of science uh, in the 17th and early 18th century. Some of you will be familiar with uh, Jonathan Swift's book, Gulliver's Travels. And in that book, there's a section where he lampoons the activities of the Royal Society and mocks them. Here's this grand academy of the Legado, where they're doing all of these experiments which are directly modeled on experiments conducted at the Royal Society. And this mockery of the activities of the Royal Society was by no means uncommon, and it certainly wasn't unprecedented. So we sometimes forget that science had a relatively fragile status at this time, and that's why it stands in need of uh, legitimation that comes from outside. Now, as I say, I'll talk more about the specifics of that question uh, when I come to section five. But what I want to do now is to move on to this question of the presuppositions uh, that make science possible. Um, and what we can say is that generally, there's a general presupposition uh, for, that make, about science, and that is that nature is actually intelligible and that human beings have the capacity to discern that intelligibility. And I think that's true of any scientific culture from the ancient Greeks uh, through. But there is a specific mode of intelligibility that emerges in the 17th century, and that is the conception of laws of nature. Now, up until this time, what a law of nature meant, up until the 17th century, laws of nature meant moral laws that God had prescribed. So discussions about laws of nature were always in terms of moral laws that were the consequence of divine commands, right? The obvious one, you know, thou shalt not kill. That's a law of nature. Now, what's interesting is that in the 17th century, that conception of a law of nature is transferred from the moral realm to the physical realm, 
But again, the laws of nature are still regarded as being of divine origin. Let me give you an example of some laws of nature and then I'll talk about the question of divine origin. And this gets us back again to Johannes Kepler and I've already introduced him to you. Uh, and, and Kepler is the guy who, who is the first person to articulate laws of planetary motion. Uh, and uh, you, you're probably less familiar with these than, than even Boyle's law, but uh, I've got an animation here that will show some of these, uh, some of these laws of nature. Oh, maybe I don't. Oh, no, there it is. Okay, yes. Um, so the orbit of a planet uh, is an ellipse that has the sun at one of the two foci, and that's the first law, and there's a mathematical description of that there. The second law is that with these ellipses, uh, as a planet moves, the area under the curve in each case is the same. So the, area, the red area equals the blue area. And again, there's a specific mathematical formula that provided here. It's rather small that you can see. And then the third one, which we've started, is really quite remarkable, I think. And it says the square the square of the orbital period, the time it takes for the planet to go around the sun, is proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. Okay, So the question is, why is it that nature has this particular mathematical structure? Why is it that nature has this particular mathematical structure? Um, a, a modern uh, physicist, Eugene Wigner, has talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Now you might say that this unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics is just a brute feature of, of the universe, but Kepler was quite explicit about this and he said that the reason that the universe answers to our mathematical descriptions is that God has stamped a mathematical character on the universe. And so the reason we look for mathematical structures in the universe is because we have a conviction that God has stamped a particular mathematical order on the universe. The best articulation of this idea of laws of nature comes not from Kepler, who actually uh, gave us these laws of nature, but from the French philosopher René Descartes, uh, who is the guy who really develops the notion of a law of nature in a strong way. We know Descartes from Philosophy 101 as the guy who said, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. But Descartes was primarily a scientist and that philosophical stuff was really kind of a post facto justification of his scientific project. But for Descartes, God is the guy who, uh, who basically moves matter and moves matter according to particular uh, mathematical formulae. So as he says here, God imparts various motions to matter and he now preserves this matter in the same way in the same way that he originally created it. And what Descartes goes on to say is that laws of nature, they're immutable and they're infinite because they derive that immutability from God who is their source. Okay? Now once Descartes gets this idea of laws of nature up and running, the, the English scientists are going to take it over and we've introduced Boyle already, father of chemistry, guy who gives us Boyle's law, here he is on what the laws of motion are. They don't spring from the matter, they're not inherent in the stuff of the universe, but rather they depend on the will of God. So God directly imposes laws on matter, that's why matter acts in this lawful mathematical way, and that's why we can discover these particular mathematical structures called laws of nature. And I'll give you one more from the theologian and philosopher Samuel Clarke, most famous for being a champion of Newton's uh, philosophy uh, in, in a famous conflict that he had with the philosopher Leibniz. But Clark says this, the course of nature, the lawful structure, lawful operations of nature is nothing else but the arbitrary will and pleasure of God acting on matter continually. So the very presupposition that there are laws of nature comes from this theological idea that these are laws directly promulgated by God who stamps this mathematical character on the world. And more than that, 
because as Samuel Clark has pointed out here God could have put into place any, any range of uh, mathematical laws perhaps the, uh, the, the square of the orbital period would have been directly proportional to the square of the mean distance rather than the cube right so in order to find out what the laws are we've got to do this empirical work we have to discover what God has instantiated, to use the fancy philosophical word, instantiated or stamped onto the world. And that's precisely what we get in this description in Newton's famous work, the Principia Mathematica, possibly the most famous uh, work of science ever written, where he sets out the laws of gravitation. The true business of philosophy and philosophy is the word they use for science, philosophy or natural philosophy, is to inquire after the laws that the grand creator actually chose to found this most beautiful frame of the world, not those by which he might have done so had he so pleased. So the point here is we can't simply intuit the mathematical structure of the universe. We have to do the empirical inquiry, the experimental inquiry that discovers what these mathematical patterns are that God has stamped on the universe. So to sum up the very general point I want to make here, insofar as science assumes that there are mathematical laws of nature that can be discovered and have these particular, uh, these particular uh, mathematical qualities, uh, the original assumption that motivated this idea is essentially a theological one. And as I say, we don't have this conception of laws of nature prior to the 17th century. So religion then provides this crucial presupposition for modern science and mathematical physics. Now the last thing then I wanted to talk about was the way in which religion informs methods of investigation and we've already got some hint of, of this because if God arbitrarily chooses to impose a particular mathematical structure on the universe then we need to go out into the world and, and experimentally discover what that is. I'm now going to give you uh, a set of reasons why uh, experiment seems to be a good idea uh, and also why the whole scientific enterprise is something that from a religious perspective uh, we ought to value. And this uh, thesis is set out in this book, um, The Fall of Man and the Foundations of Science, and the theological doctrine that I'm going to talk about as being crucially important here is this idea of the fall. And just to explain what the fall is, the story that we get in Genesis, Adam and Eve are placed in the garden, they're placed in a perfect situation. They choose to disobey God, and as a consequence, they're cast out of the Garden of Eden, uh, and that is the story of the fall. Now, this, this story, in the, the, the ways in which it was told in the 17th century, was told in a quite literal way, but Adam was presented in his original perfect condition as someone who had an almost omniscient knowledge of the workings of nature. Adam, in other words, was understood to be the perfect scientist. He knew the natures, and, and a key part of this was the fact that he named the creatures. And what that suggested to 17th century biblical interpreters was that Adam knew their natures, and he gave them a name that was apt to them. More than that, Adam was thought to have understood astronomy perfectly, and indeed, People like Newton and Descartes, when they wrote their new scientific theories, they really believed that all they were doing was rediscovering theories that Adam had known, and perhaps to some extent even Moses had known, and that these theories about universal gravity and so on were implicit in the Genesis text. It's a little bit uh, far-fetched, but there it is. So, so there are stories then about Adam having a perfect knowledge of nature, but as a consequence of the fall, losing that knowledge. Okay, so the fall was not just a moral lapse, it was a fall away from knowledge, and more than that, a fall away from the capacity actually to grasp how nature operated. Now the other thing we need to understand is that the science that emerges in the 17th century is replacing a medieval science that was based on Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. And Aristotelian science, to cut a very long story short, 
had these sorts of characteristics. Um, it was based on common sense observations of everyday experience. Okay? So Aristotle's science was ex experience based. That's, that's for sure, but it was not experimentally based. And so in our normal experience, heavy objects like hammers fall faster than light objects like feathers. Okay? Heavy objects fall faster than light ones. So there's a kind of generalization based on common sense. It was a key part of Aristotle. If you put an object into motion, will it continue in motion? No, it won't. It will eventually stop. So again, here's part of Aristotelian science based on common sense, that things that are moving will eventually run out of puff and stop. Okay? Uh, that the principles of motion on Earth, terrestrial motion, those principles are very different from the motions in the heavens, where things seem to move in perfect circles. And indeed, they do seem to move eternally, unlike things on Earth. Another common sense observation, the Earth is not in motion. We don't appear to be hurtling through space uh, at thousands of miles an hour. Now, each of these things we now know scientifically to be false. We know that objects accelerate with a uniform velocity, uh, right? But, but that objects will, you know, the heavy object and the light object, in a vacuum, the hammer and the feather will fall at the same rate. And there's a wonderful experiment. Some of the guys on the moon took a hammer and a feather and they actually held them up you can find it on YouTube, and it's quite amazing to see the feather on the hammer go the way they go. But what's interesting is that in order for that to work, you have to have an artificial contrived situation. It's only under experimental conditions that you see that, those, that the common sense observations don't hold true. And it's the same thing for things in motion, right? So we know that a law of motion is that a thing that's in motion will continue in motion until a force acts upon it. But that's something you don't actually see in nature. That's something you see under specific experimental conditions. So part of the move from an Aristotelian science based on common sense to a contemporary experimental science is to forget about common sense observations and to think about doing observations under strict and counterfactual conditions. Now, why might we do that? Well, I'm getting to that, and that's to do with the fall. OK, so bear in mind that that's the picture of Aristotle that we're going to dismiss with a new experimental science and that this theological idea of the fall has something to do with that. Let me just say a little bit more, and that is that although the fall had been a standard Christian doctrine, certainly from Augustine on, and Augustine is the guy, well, I won't get into Augustine, let's just, <laughs> let's just stick with that for the moment. But... Protestant reformers, Luther and Calvin, who were, who were up and running in the 16th century, what they thought was that the Catholic Church, partly as a consequence of its, its happy relationship with classical philosophy and Aristotle, had tended to uh, forget about the fall and uh, underestimate the damage that was wrought by the fall and underestimate the loss of scientific knowledge that occurred as a consequence of the fall. So here's a quote from John Calvin, just to give you that point, that the corruption of our nature, he says, was unknown to the philosophers, uh, and corruption, he goes on to say, does not reside in one part only, but pervades the whole soul and each of its faculties. Now, this is Calvin's famous doctrine of total depravity, and the total here refers to the fact that the fall affects every, every human faculty. So it's not just a moral thing, it also affects our intellect, right? That's why it's total. Aristotle didn't understand that, and that's why Aristotle thought we could have a science based on common sense observations. That science wouldn't be too hard because there was really nothing wrong with our cognitive apparatus. And Calvin says, no, actually there is, and therefore science will have to be different if it takes that, that view about the corruption of our nature. And here's Luther, who again makes a, a similar point. It's impossible that nature could be understood by human reason, he says, after the fall of Adam. Okay? So the scientific enterprise is now under threat. Certainly Aristotle's easy version of science is not going to work. Okay. Let me just give you one more uh, example before I start to get on to the scientists. And I'm going to move here to Blaise Pascal, who was a wonderful mathematician, a poet, uh, and, and a theologian. 
Um, again, Pascal's principle is a hydraulic principle for those of you who are into, uh, into hydraulics. And here's what Pascal says about ancient philosophy and why the ancient philosophers never really got it. So he's talking in part about Aristotle. He says, if they realised man's excellence, they didn't know about his corruption. Now, that's the same point that Calvin was making. And, OK, there's a lot of stuff in there. But he goes on to say, either they became vain and confident, Aristotle, or they became complete sceptics. OK, and that's the, as he goes on to say, the, the academicians are the academic sceptics. So he said, the problem with the ancients is they fell into one of two extremes. Either they were very confident in human capacities because they didn't know about the fall, and that gives you an Aristotelian kind of science. If they didn't do that, they were completely sceptical and they, they thought that knowledge was impossible and that they were the two extremes. Now, what modern experimental science is going to be is it's going to be something smack in the middle, that it's not going to be overly optimistic, but it's not going to be completely sceptical either. So it's a kind of mitigated, middle-path scepticism, uh -huh, and that's where I'm headed with this idea. And I'll just give you one more example. We possess an image of truth, uh, sorry, we perceive an image of truth, says Pascal, but we possess nothing but falsehood. Uh, and he says, being equally incapable of both ignorance and certain knowledge, it's obvious that we once enjoyed a degree of perfection from which we are unhappily fallen. Now, this is the key thing, because we have an image of perfection that we have in Adam so we understand that there's a possibility of a perfect knowledge, but we also understand our fallen condition, which means that that is not completely achievable in this life, but we shouldn't go the whole path of scepticism, right? And this frames, then, the extremes in which modern science emerges as a conception. And I'll now move to someone who's of key importance in providing the foundations for new scientific methodology, and that's the philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon, who really sets out the, the, the basis of experimental science for the Royal Society. And th this, this passage and a couple of others I'm going to give you, in a nutshell, show the importance of this story about Adam's fall for motivating the new science. So as he says, man by the fall fell both from his innocency and his dominion over nature, right? So Adam had a perfect dominion over nature. But here's the key thing. Both of these losses, even in this life, can be in some part repaired, the latter by arts, the former by religion and faith, and the latter by arts and sciences. Okay. So here's the story. We fell away from an originally perfect knowledge of nature, but don't give up on that. In part, this can be restored in the, in the present life by the sciences. There was a moral and an intellectual fall. Religion helps us with the moral bit. But the sciences are what we need to get back our dominion over nature. And so we have here, really, the program for the religious legitimation of the whole scientific enterprise. And we also have, uh, as I'll try and spell out, the, the, the justification for a particular experimental approach. Let, let me just give you one more quote from Bacon, and then I'm going to give you uh, a quote from some of the Royal Society people, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So he says, Bacon, knowledge is to be sought not for the quiet of resolution, but for a, re a restitution and reinvesting of man to the sovereignty and power he had in his first state of creation. So once again, I've just given you a few examples, but this story about Adam and the fall is almost ubiquitous, particularly in English, English writings in the 17th century. And these guys want to argue this story is the key to understanding why we now need to re-establish our dominion over nature. It's part of a redemptive activity, but we can't establish the perfect, easy science that Aristotle thought we could do because we're fallen, we need to have a science that is really, uh, it's a lot of hard work, it takes a lot of people, it takes a very hard interrogation of nature. It's not just common sense observations, because our minds are fallen and even our senses are, are fallen. Now, one more example from Robert Hooke, 
who was the first curator of experiments of the Royal Society. He played an important role, uh, although Newton didn't acknowledge it very much, an important role in uh, establishing the inverse square law that was part of the universal law of gravitation. But this again, in a nutshell, tells the story about the importance of this narrative of original sin and the fall in motivating scientific inquiry. So every man, he says, from a, a derived corruption innate and born within him, and that's this idea of original sin and the fall, uh, and from his breeding and converse with men is, is subject to slip into all sorts of errors. Right? There's the analysis, the theological analysis of the human condition, and then the conclusion, what follows. These being the dangers and processes of humane reason, the remedies of them all can only proceed from the real, the mechanical, and the experimental philosophy. That is to say, experimental science provides the remedy for the internal and innate corruption of human beings. Okay, now as I said, that thesis is, is a kind of book-length thesis, and I've just sketched it out very roughly here. I hope you've got the general idea of where that's going, but let me say something about what are the features of this new science and how those features fit into this story about the fall that I've just set out. So, first of all, we have our knowledge then, according to these guys, is now probabilistic and it's not demonstrative. And to cut a long story short, the goal of Aristotle's science was to have logically demonstrable knowledge, okay? And what the new experimental philosophers are saying is actually we can't achieve that. The best we can do is probabilistic, instrumentalist kind of knowledge. We can't actually know things as they are in themselves. All we can understand is their appearances. Okay? And again, this is part of uh, the new experimental approach. Crucially, knowledge, scientific knowledge is not ever going to be the product of a single brilliant mind. It's going to be corporate. That means we need lots and lots of people to do it. And it's going to be cumulative, which means we need lots and lots of time to make it work. So we get lots of people working on small problems over a long period of time. And as Bacon famously argued, this is the kind of thing that needs government support. You can't just have a few bright people coming up with ideas. These sorts of corporate activities require uh, the the, uh, the mobilisation of the, the the financial resources of a community. Knowledge is experimental, and experimental in the 17th century is simply a synonym for experiential. So it's based on experience rather than reason, and this is because our reason is fallen. So often you, you get the idea that science is based on reason. For these people in the 17th century, it wasn't based on reason at all. It was based on experience. And you could start to derive conclusions based on experience. But certainly, it wasn't reason alone that was giving you the results. Reason was highly suspect. Our senses had fallen, and this then provides a justification for instruments like microscopes and telescopes. Luther actually remarks that Adam had telescopic vision. So Adam could actually literally see uh, what was going on in the universe. And as a consequence of the fall, he lost that. Right? That was not an uncommon idea. So now we have the, the notion where we have the first use of scientific instruments, that these instruments are ways of overcoming the limitations of human senses. More than that, the natural world itself has fallen and resists attempts to know it. Again, unlike the Aristotelian view that we can easily know what's going on in nature, and therefore nature needs to be uh, experimented on under special circumstances so we get the true picture of how it operates. And that's why uh, Bacon sometimes uses these metaphors of torture. Not as often as some people have argued, but nonetheless he does use those sort of aggressive interrogation uh, notions. And then summing it up, the whole of this new methodological approach is imagined to be a kind of therapeutic regimen, uh, a medicine, as it were, that's applied to overcome the inherent limitation of reason and the senses. So that, in a nutshell, is why I think this religious idea about the fall, which comes into prominence partly as a, as a result of the Protestant reformers' emphasis on original sin, 
This underpins the experimental approach to the natural world, and more than that, it provides a theological legitimacy for the scientific enterprise, which is seen to be now a recovery of the dominion over nature that Adam had enjoyed uh, in paradise. So wrapping it up, historically religion and science have interacted in a number of, of different ways. And as, as I've suggested to you, uh, you know, motivations, choice between competing theories, uh, presuppositions, sanctions, and then finally underpinning specific methods of investigation. In the 16th and 17th centuries, religion played uh, a positive role in the emergence and crucially the persistence of science. So we haven't just talked about brilliant scientific minds, we've talked about why it is that we have a scientific culture that is consolidated and persists. Um, religious values, I argue, are what gives science its initial legitimation. The whole idea of laws and nature, laws of nature, provides us with the presuppositions that make science possible, and this conception of laws of nature was originally a theological conception. Uh, the fall and experimental science, the fall explains why we have these particular methods to some extent. It gives us motivations to recapture the dominion over nature that we once had, and it makes science uh, a religiously legitimate enterprise. In sum then, when we ask the question of why did science emerge in the West and why does it emerge in the 17th century and how did it come to occupy a central place in Western culture ever since then, a significant part of the answer is to do with religious considerations. Uh, religion, in short, was a necessary precondition for the emergence and persistence of modern science. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I think the uh, acoustics in this room and the microphones are supposed to be good enough. If you'll stand where you are and speak up, we'll be able to hear your question. Yes. Hi. Uh, this was really an interesting perspective, and, and uh, thank you. So you, you kind of answered why, like what was, the, so I have two quick questions. You answer whichever one you think is more interesting. Okay. But the, the, the question of, so then what was missing in Islamic culture uh -huh. and Chinese cultures yep. that didn't then afford itself to the scientific question? And what happened in our culture that science seemed to get, that there seemed to be like this, this point where science then decided, you know what, we don't need God anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then there's this other sort of religious component which says, wait, science, you went too far. Mm -hmm. We don't really trust you fully. So yeah. like, there was a schism there. Yeah. So those yeah. are kind of two questions. Yeah, no, they're both excellent, excellent questions. questions. They're probably both <laughs> worth answering or, or be brief. So the, 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 the question about science in Islam and, Ch and China is a kind of famous question. Um, Joseph Needham was a, a historian of Chinese science who asked this question about China. Uh, Toby Huff has asked this question about Islam. And I have to say, the answers to these questions are controversial amongst historians. I think in the case of Islam, to some extent, it, it's, it's relatively simple. Uh, and it's to do with the demise of uh, uh, Islamic civilization that, and, and necessarily every aspect of the culture uh, struggled. Um, and, and so that's just a, a pure historical contingency. Other people have argued that in Islam, uh, the, the key missing ingredient is the educational institutions. The church founds the universities in the 12th, well, from the t roughly the 12th century in the West. Uh, and these universities become real powerhouses and factories of scientific knowledge, initially Aristotelian, but laying the foundations for modern science. So, but th there are lots of variables and it's a little bit overdetermined. In China, one answer I think that's, that's come up a number of times is the absence of a conception of laws of nature. Um, <clears throat> and so it's not merely what's absent in these cultures, it's also what's present in the West that's not there. And, and I've, as I've said to you the, tonight, you know, laws of nature is a key part. You have a different conception of the order of nature in China and one that makes, makes it not possible to develop the sort of mathematical physics that, that you get in the West. 
So they're two quick answers, but I mean, I would say it, this remains a very interesting question for historians and a, and a problematic one, but, but historians like myself and Stephen Gorkroger, I put up there, want to argue that, that a key variable is Christianity for various reasons. And I should say Stephen Gorkroger is not an apologist for Christianity, it's just that happens to be uh, <coughs> the historical situation. Now, the second part of the question I think is very interesting. Um, how is it that then that we forgot that uh, that science originally had had these um, uh, these foundations, and there's a couple of reasons. I think one is that science, once it established legitimacy, uh, it, it it didn't need religion anymore. It seemed it it had enough momentum just to keep going. Uh, in England in the 19th century, and I think it's the 19th century when the, all this starts to come apart, um, <coughs> uh, there is a there's a, a an explicit question of professionalism uh, that the scientific profession emerges for the first time. So it's, it's in the 19th century the, uh, the word scientist appears for the first time in English and scientists uh, as want to assume for themselves uh, a social authority. In England they realise that they need to take that from the clergy who are at this time are the dominant cultural authority and there's an explicit attempt on the part of people like Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, to reduce the influence of the clergy and to increase the influence of science. And to some extent, th this is an understandable situation. I think the church had too much power then, science had too little. But now uh, we have this situation where there's a perceived conflict between science and religion, and science is perceived to hold, you know, the, hold the, the key cards, as it were. So that's a very quick answer to, to what I think are two good questions. <coughs> So a powerful quote from the early thinkers that um, put theology as their, their motivation. How would you respond to the counter argument that they might they were just trying to yeah apply yeah. yeah. themselves yeah. to yeah. the church in order to be able to continue what they were doing, yeah. not legitimately motivated that way? Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, I think this is a, this is a question that that often arises, <clears throat> and the answer to I think is that that if you read these people, it's very clear that. Well, Oh, sorry, to repeat, to repeat the question, question. When, we, when we find people in the 17th century making reference to religious considerations, how do we know that they're not simply doing it uh, to, <clears throat> to, as it were, pander to religious interests to make themselves look religiously respectable so that this is just a gloss that really is not essential to the scientific activity? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think two things. First of all, when you read these people, you understand that they're serious about their religious claims. But the second thing is that the science doesn't work without the religious presuppositions. Okay? These guys have got no reason to think there are laws of nature unless they believe God instantiated them. Okay? So, <clears throat> and as I say, there's, you know, from, from, uh, from Descartes to, to Boyle to Newton, all of these people who are espousing a conception of laws of nature uh, do so, uh, you know, the very conception of it is not possible without the, th it doesn't work without the theology. I mean, that's the point with regard to, to laws of, of nature. It, I mean, having said that, um, I think there are some people who, I mean, Descartes is very interesting on this. I have no, no doubt that Descartes is, is quite sincere in his religion. But he is also very cautious of, uh, he's, he's very cautious about the situation, partly in light of the fact that he's, uh, he's acutely aware of what happened to Galileo. And, and just, excuse me, just to give you an example, Descartes is about to publish a Copernican uh, text, Le Monde, in 1633. He hears that, Descartes, that Galileo has been condemned and he puts that on hold. And that's actually when he starts to do his philosophical stuff. So he starts to do his you know, meditations and uh, as a consequence of putting the scientific stuff to the side because he's a little bit worried about what the religious authorities are going to say about him propounding a Copernican model. So it, my, my point is that it's not the case that religion is always, is always the, a positive force, um, but in the case of things like laws of nature, it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's just patently obvious that that's not going to get up and running without the theological foundations, you know. So. <coughs>
think you uh, responded very well to the question about why there. In other words, why the West and not um, Islamic civilization or China? The question that um, historians, of course, are always very interested in is why then? Uh -huh. So why the 16th and 17th century um, as opposed to earlier in Christendom? And another question I have is, I, this is a very complex story that you're telling and compelling about um, Christianity uh, having these values that legitimate scientific research. But I'm trying, again, it's so complex, it's not easily reducible to adjectives mm. or nouns. But I'm just wondering, can you tell me what those, can you articulate those values uh, in a word or <laughs> a phrase? Yeah. Uh, just so I can have something very simple to walk away with. Okay. Uh, yeah. Those are the values. <laughs> what are the values? Did you hear the question? I, I can, let me, re I'll repeat the question. So I've answered the question of where in the West, but what, when, why, why is it the 17th century that this happens, right, and not sort of before or after? And then the second one is, is there a quick and dirty version of what the values are in Christianity that promote, okay, so... Again, good, good questions. I think the when is a very interesting one because, again, there is some variation in, in historians of science about whether there was, in fact, a scientific revolution at all or whether there's simply a continuity from the medieval period. And if there's a continuity from the medieval period, the whole idea of a Copernican revolution or a scientific revolution is a little bit problematic. Now, <clears throat> I can see problems with the conception of a scientific revolution, but I think something very distinct happens. And, and there are the real answer to the when, I think, is that the Protestant Reformation is a key part of the story. And the Protestant Reformation, first of all, legitimates uh, attacks on Aristotle, because Aristotle is associated with an old Catholic establishment. So that, that's just one instance of this. The possibility of the, a whole project of reform uh, is, is then made possible by the Protestant Reformation, and that's a reform not merely of the church, but of the whole edifice of learning. So Luther attacks Aristotle. He attacks the role of Aristotle in the universities in England. Um, this is used as an opportunity to... Uh, Francis Bacon explicitly says, we had a religious reformation in the previous century. Now we need a reformation of learning to go along with that. Uh, and the other thing about the Protestant Reformation is, as I've suggested, this new theological anthropology that comes with Luther and Calvin, by theological anthropology I mean a theological conception of, of human personhood that emphasises the fallen condition of human beings in a way that hadn't been the case so much in medieval uh, theological anthropology. And that's why I put those quotes from Luther and Calvin up there. So I think part of the when question is to do with a, 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 a scientific revolution that follows upon a, a Protestant Reformation. And the other thing here, of course, is the Renaissance, which is, <coughs> again, a, an element that I haven't spoken about a, at all. But in terms of these, these, period, these categories of periodization, historians often attack them, but I think there's a lot to them. And so the when question, I think, is at least partly answered by the Protestant Reformation is really a key part of that story. Now, the second part of your question, uh, is there a, a, a quick and dirty version of the Christian values? Yeah, look, in essence, it's the notion of re-establishing dominion over nature that gives legitimacy. That's, that's the key part of Bacon. So Adam had dominion. There was a command in Genesis 1.28 to exercise dominion, and that's then regarded as, <clears throat> again, if... Let me, I can complicate the story a little bit, but dominion is a key part. Up until this period, dominion had often been construed as a psychological dominion, that dominion over the beasts had meant a psychological dominion within the mind of, over our bestial passions. And we see in the 17th century the literal reading of this idea of dominion is, no, it's not just a self-dominion, it's a, dom a literal dominion over the, over the world, and that motivates scientific inquiry, and it also motivates colonisation. Okay, so so that's that's one element of it, and the other part is this notion of the fall, um, <coughs> which is related to dominion, but the 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 the, the fall then will give us the the uh, the necessity for an experimental approach to this. So, the general project re-establish dominion over nature. Okay. The means to do it, an experimental natural philosophy, because only an experimental natural philosophy takes seriously our limitations as human beings in a way that the preceding Aristotelian science didn't. Was that? Yeah. Yeah, no. I should have said, did I say that in the lecture or not? Maybe I didn't. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you.